So we're behind schedule, but uh, we'd like to move on uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Spinato's uh, presentation. Uh, impose uh, voluntary efforts for safety, please. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you to the working group for inviting INPO. Uh, am I on, by the way? Lost the slides. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. There we go. Okay, so th thank you to the working group for inviting uh, IMPO to this uh, meeting. Uh, I've heard that you've been discussing uh, IMPO at previous meetings. Uh, I hope uh, tonight I can answer any of your unanswered questions about IMPO. So the purpose of my presentation this evening uh, is, is to share with you the experience of the U.S. industry after the Three Mile Island accident, uh, and most notably the formation of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, or IMPO. Uh, we'll review three topics. The first is the uh, historical review of the challenges confronting the U.S. nuclear industry uh, after uh, uh, an IMPO after the Three Mile Island accident. Secondly, the essential factors that have enabled IMPO to influence industry performance. And thirdly, a look at, at head at what we see as today's challenges in the nuclear industry. Next slide, please. So how many people here were working in the mid-60s in the nuclear power industry? Anyone? Mid-60s. OK, no one. How about the 70s? So I started my career in 1971. And so the early history of uh, nuclear power in the, U in the U.S. in the mid-60s and early 70s was really an exciting period. Uh, we, we used to say back then that uh, nuclear power is going to be too cheap to meter. Wouldn't even need an you know, a, a electric meter on your house. So it, it was uh, viewed as an unlimited power source and as effective hedge uh, to the use of oil. You remember we had uh, the high price of oil in the 70s. Uh, a large number of companies uh, went into nuclear power, uh, and, and, and there was rapid growth. But, and, and, but nuclear power was just viewed as an alternate means of generating electricity. And complexities, inherent hazards, and need for uncompromising standards were unrecognized. We all know now that nuclear power is special and unique, but this was not well recognized in that period. Next slide, please. So that, that all changed in 1979. On March 28, 1979, at 4 a.m. in the morning, a minor secondary plant transient cascaded into a reactor accident and partial meltdown of the reactor core at the Three Mile Island Unit 2 nuclear plant. The accident frightened the public and enthusiasm for nuclear power went away. The accident revealed poor operating practices and standards, weak training, particularly in operations, plant design weaknesses, emergency planning weaknesses, and poor use of operating experience. Although uh, health effects were not seen from this accident, it forever changed the U.S. industry. The immediate effect was the cancellation of many plants, the loss of billions of dollars invested in partially constructed plants, and a severe erosion of public trust. Next slide, please. President uh, Jimmy Carter named John Kemeny as chairman of a presidential commission to investigate the accident. Several of the recommendations from this presidential commission served as the foundation for INPO and its programs. This included, included setting and enforcing standards of excellence. It was recognized uh, that regulatory compliance is required 
but will always be insufficient to assure safety. It was recognized that there is a need for ever rising standards of excellence and, and the formation of a safety culture throughout the industry was needed. The commission also said there needed to be a reporting and analysis of operating experience. So let me point out that prior to the Three Mile Island accident at the Dav Davis Bessie plant in Ohio, they had a similar event, a similar transient uh, with the power operator relief valves, but the operators at that plant were able to control the transient and stop the event. This information was not provided to the operators at Three Mile Island. And in fact, later analysis found out that there had by, been nine similar pressure, power operated relief valve failures uh, in the industry that had not been shared. So uh, uh, therefore an important uh, uh, recommendation from the, the commission and a lesson learned is that there be, had to be good communication and use of operating experience. And I have to tell you, um, Worldwide, there is still not good reporting and use of operating experience. It just isn't. It's uh, one of the deficiencies in WANO that, it, that were noted uh, in the recent self-assessments. So another key recommendation of the commission uh, was the accreditation of training programs that included rigorous standards for training and qualification that extended beyond the control room to include maintenance, engineering, radiological protection, and chemistry personnel, as well as a focus on high standards of operator crew training and plant-specific simulators. I know, I know when I went to work at Three Mile Island after the accident, they, uh, they had a cardboard simulator. They didn't even have a real simulator. And in fact, during the accident, uh, one of the most knowledgeable, one of the most knowledgeable uh, shift supervisors was off, that, off at another site uh, going to simulate a training. Uh, so he couldn't be reached. To, uh, when they were in trouble, they tried to call this man because he was like the best, but they couldn't reach him because he was off at another site getting simulated training because they didn't have their own simulator. Next slide. So in, in, in December uh, seven, 1979, IMPO was formed. And although we didn't have a vision at that time, this is our vision today. Key elements of the vision are as follows. Uh, the vision is aspirational. We strive such that others see us this way. IMPO must set the global standard, not just the US standard. Well, what does that mean? IMPO thinks it's the best. Well, we don't do this alone. We go around the world to find the best practices and incorporate them in the standards that we create for the U.S. industry and that we share uh, with, uh, with WANO. We demand excellence of ourselves and expect it of uh, others. So I think I explained to the interpreters beforehand what this means is, okay, I demand that I give you a great presentation so you fully understand uh, IMPO. I demand that excellence of myself. I expect that they do a good job, too. I can't, I can't demand it. I expect it of them, though. Excellence cannot be mandated. It is voluntary. We expect it of others. We, can, we cannot require it you know, as a regulation. However, to be a member of IMPO, an organization accepts the, the obligation to strive for excellence. Next slide, please. Over the years, the IMPO mission to promulgate the highest levels of safety and reliability to promote excellence in the operation of commercial nuclear power plants has remained essentially unchanged. In fact, the only thing we have changed uh, was about eight years ago, we changed in the operation of commercial nuclear plants, it used to say electric generating plants. The reason we did that is because uh, we have some international participants uh, in Canada that uh, they, they, they produce power, but it's for medical isotope production, or WANO has a member uh, 
in, uh, and, and we have an international participant in England uh, that's a reprocessing site. So we, we changed our mission only slightly. Okay, next. So impulsive operations are defined by our core work. So evaluations, uh, some of you are familiar with peer reviews. Well, the process was cr uh, created uh, from IMPO evaluations and uh, where we set and enforce standards of excellence. Uh, originally, when we did the first pilot evaluation uh, in, in the early months of 1980, right after IMPO was formed. And uh, we did about four pilots. And then in the, in the fall of 1980, uh, we started the, uh, the full evaluations. And the, these evaluations were originally about nine member teams, nine people on the team. Uh, and they did a few areas, operations, organizational effectiveness, for example. Now the teams are 20 to 25 people. Uh, they look at all areas of the plant. And when we talk about, when, when Neil talked about operational excellence, we talk about the big O operations. That's the in, entire site, not just the operations department. Our, our evaluations originally started out uh, almost like checklist. And we got away from that quickly because we said we don't want to be another regulator. So we, 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 we started performance-based uh, evaluations where we actually spend a majority of our time in the field observing work, observing operators in the control rooms, uh, maintenance workers perform work. Currently our teams are made up of about one-third uh, skilled evaluators one-third individuals on loan to IMPO, so these are people that have current experience, and then a one-third are people that are right from the plant and they spend three weeks with us. So somebody will come right out of the control room as a shift manager and come to IMPO for three weeks. So we found that this is the proper mix of our teams doing evaluations. Uh, one, one of the steps in gaining credibility of IMPO uh, in 1984, about three year, four years after doing evaluations, is we added a uh, senior reactor operator uh, right out of the control room as a peer on all of our evaluations. So that was a step change we made and that gave us a lot of credibility with the industry. So we, we evaluate all areas of the plant, both functional and cross-functional. We also, uh, for every evaluation which we conduct uh, at all stations every two years, uh, we look at the crew performance in, in the simulator. Uh, another essential element of our evaluation is an exit meeting with the uh, chief executive officer of the company. So Mr. Yagi, for example, if, we, if he was a U.S. CEO and we were doing one of his plants, we would have an exit meeting where our staff would brief him on the results of the evaluation, and we, we give him an assessment number. This assessment is signed by our CEO and handed personally to the CEO of the company. And we assess from one to five, with one being the best performance, five being the weakest. Originally, we started with uh, three categories, and I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Our, our second uh, area we look at is analysis and information exchange. As I, as I told you earlier, uh, the information from Davis Bessie was not shared with the operators at Three Mile Island. Now we, we have a division of IMPO that collects operating experience from around the world. And US plants, US stations on average report about 70 events per year, or we get about 7,000 events per year into our database. In comparison, Wano, for the 440 some odd stations worldwide, only gets about 1,200 to 1,500 reports a year. So as I told you earlier, this is a major weakness in Wano that we're trying to improve. So what do we do with that information? We collect it, we analyze it, and we issue reports out, back out to the industry. We have an assistance division that uh, help station meet standards with, uh, in, you know, and we get industry help. So that can be anything 
very small to major issues that the station needs help with. We also have a part of this division that focus on, focuses on the poor performing plants, what we call the outliers. Uh, you know, so I'm not going to tell you everything in the U.S. is perfect. We, we have some chronic outliers of poor performers that our board of directors uh, has told us that we must help improve. So we, we have a part of this group is focused on helping the poor performers improve. We also have a training and education division. Uh, they're responsible for the systematic approach to training. And they all, we also provide leadership training uh, for industry personnel, including members of the board of directors, CEOs, site vice presidents, plant managers, and supervisors. We also manage the National Academy for Nuclear Training for the industry. Next slide, please. So in, in addition to our core work, uh, IMPO has evolved to meet increased industry needs as I said, the establishment of the National Academy for Nuclear, State, uh, uh, Nuclear Training. We provide leadership uh, education, and I mentioned a few of those. Uh, we also do some leadership training uh, internationally. Uh, we've improved our emergency response capability after Fukushima. Uh, we we uh, built a new emergency response facility uh, for the industry. Uh, along with EPRI and others, we're also helping to improve, uh, improve supplier performance. Uh, we, we provide a lot of support to WANO. Uh, you, may, you probably don't know this, but WANO Atlanta Center is really a division of IMPO, legally. Uh, so we have 25 staff members from IMPO that are assigned to the WANO Atlanta Center. We also have a, a, about eight people assigned internationally to support WANO in addition to supporting international peer reviews. So IMPO does a lot to support WANO. In fact, 90% of WANO's documents come from IMPO. And then, of course, uh, we have an international participant program that represents 75% uh, of the uh, plants around the world. Uh, and uh, the Japanese industry is represented by John C. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, the, the, yeah, so, so this is IMPO today. Uh, we have uh, 25 member operating companies, 104 op 100 operating reactors. Just last year we had 104, uh, but uh, we had four shut down, Crystal River because of uh, containment issues, San Onofre because of steam generator issues, and Kiwani really because of economic issues. Uh, we have five reactors under construction. Uh, two at Plan Vogel, two at Scana, and one at Watts Bar. We have 26 international participants, 28 supplier participants. Next slide. Oops. I think you, you missed one slide. Go, go back. Two slides. No, go back. Well, wrong way. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, that was it. No. I, I need the clicker. <laughs> Oh, that was it? <laughs> yes, okay. So IMPO has about 500 employees. 388 employees are permanent. Uh, 66 are on, on loan employees. Th this includes about 12 liaison engineers. We have uh, three Japanese liaison engineers uh, on loan to us. Uh, and we also have about 40 or so contractors. Uh, this is our budget that was just approved uh, in 2014. Okay, now two slides, please. So th this relationship chart. Uh, so I, I think Neil and uh, Tony Petrangelo gave you insights into their organization. I think one of the best uh, ways we can show how NEI, EPRI, and IMPO work together is the Fukushima Steering Committee, which Neil is part of. I think our, our industry, so that, that, that includes high-level CEOs, CNOs from the U.S. industry, NEI, EPRI, and IMPO representation working together for the U.S. industry response to the accident at Fukushima. And they've been in place, when were you formed? Uh, right after, right? June after the accident. So that, that's really a good example. So let me talk a little bit about the NRC. So 
in the, and some of this may seem familiar to you in Japan uh, as, after Fukushima, but in the aftermath of uh, Three Mile Island, uh, the NRC was an embattled agency. That was, uh, they, they were facing a steady, steady barrage of criticism uh, from our Congress, from the news media, and the public. So in order to help restore public confidence and credibility that were lost as a result of the accident, it sought, it sought to avoid the appearance of working hand in hand with the industry. So we say it kept everybody at arm's length, including Impo. At times, the relationship between the NRC and Impo in the early days uh, was, was difficult. Uh, and we, we said it was uh, led to what we call sharp elbows, people just you know, trying to say who, who has power. Uh, but Impo's determination to coerce the industry um, into achieving performance levels that exceeded NRC requirements uh, gen generated a certain amount of tension. You know, Impo is saying that the regulations are not enough for excellence. Uh, Impo also worried that the NRC rules were too inflexibly prescriptive uh, that they discourage utilities from moving beyond mere compliance with regulation to excellence. So despite this, these inherent obstacles, the NRC and Impo gradually developed a satisfactory working relationship and to, today we describe this relationship as independent but complementary. So we, we have a, an MOA with the uh, NRC. We have an annual uh, senior uh, management uh, meeting. This, this meeting I, I'm going to miss. It's this week, so I'm here. It's going to be in two days. Um, so it's really the high levels of the NRC, the EDO, and our CEO and our executives go to that meeting. Uh, we also have routine meetings in several areas, including training, operating experience, new plant deployment. I have a meeting with the international, uh, the director of international projects uh, at, the, uh, at the NRC, and we talk about plants around the world that worry us. So th there's a lot we do uh, with the NRC. Okay, let's see, let's go ahead and skip that. <coughs> Let me just get a drink of water, excuse me. Thank you, Rosa. Sorry. I should have brought it with me. Mm. So. No, I want him to go back. <laughs> Wrong way. There we go. One. Forward. No, wrong way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, so in the early days, Impo had many challenges. These included becoming a credible organization. So those of you from John C. and in the industry, you'll, you'll recognize some of these issues because they're similar. Uh, most utilities did not see a need for change. They saw Three Mile Island as a metropolitan, metropolitan Edison issue. That is similar to saying, if you're from Chubu, or if you're from Kansai, that's a TEPCO problem. But in those days, that's the way our executives saw it. They didn't really see a need for another self-regulation. <coughs> it really was a few industry leaders, like Bill Lee, for example, from uh, Duke, Duke Power, uh, and James O'Connor from, at the time, Commonwealth Edison, that really understood the need for Impo if the industry was going to survive. So also, Impo needed to, to, obtain, to show credibility. We needed to dis demonstrate improved performance, that standards warranted change. Credibility is earned, but we also needed to be given from the leaders of the industry. That means we needed their support. The second challenge we had was obtaining uh, a competent staff. We needed people with experience and technical savvy. People that can see issues and communicate with correct perspective. We had difficulties at first. 
We really did. Uh, some utilities didn't want to give us the best people which we needed. Uh, some, they gave, some utilities gave us people that were at the end of their careers or at the very beginning. So it really took our CEO at the time to uh, demand that they send excellent people. Uh, so many companies did finally loan us the good, capable people, and they actually learned that the people came back with valuable insight. They didn't just know about their plant, they knew now about many plants from their own on loan period. In fact, the early days of Impo, the way we did policy, uh, our policy was, especially when I came, the question they asked you, will you stay five years? Because they really expected you to go back to the industry. Uh, but we realized in about 1990 that we needed to change. Because we, we needed a core staff that were really experts in evaluations. So now, as I said, we have a mix on the team, one-third, one-third, one-third. And it's because we have this competent staff at Impo that really are experts at conducting evaluations or assistance. That's what their expertise is. There are people that have been site vice presidents uh, and higher that have come to Impo and tried to qualify as a team leader and couldn't because they didn't have the ability to discern the issues, to communicate them to the CEO, uh, or they were not critical enough. So th they couldn't do it. So it, it, it is a difficult role to have. We also had to establish uh, formal programs and processes. We needed repeatable and well-managed programs such as our, our evaluation process uh, to build the confidence of the plant staff. And we had to establish the right measures. Uh, we needed to demonstrate progress and differentiate performance. Uh, the, the assessment, uh, the performance assessment pro, uh, process that we had uh, was de developed in 1983. Uh, IMPO did not want to assess plants. We didn't believe that was our role, but the, our board of directors asked us to do it. So in 1983, we started assessing plants, and as I said, we had, three, we had a three-tiered system. So people were above average, broad middle, or below average. Uh, and this was really based on the station's participation and commitment to INPO, uh, the results of the evaluation, and the judgment of INPO senior management. What we found, though, is the ranking system became an essential part of the organization's responsibility to individual CEOs and its members and identify the industry needs uh, and their lower performing plants. And it also stimulated uh, performance and improvement. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about peer pressure. So by 1985, this assessment process changed to a five-tiered, uh, and we have five grades, one being excellent, with five being the lowest performers, or marginal, if you wish. We also helped establish uh, five-year goals for U.S. industry performance. Neil showed you some charts on industry performance, on capability factor. At the end of those charts were a goal, right? So uh, the industry and impo uh, every five years, we develop new targets uh, for many of the indicators. We also had to develop a culture of excellence within IMPO. We had to have top-notch standards and, and professionalism. And we said that the IMPO staff needed to be above reproach. Next. So in, in, in 2010, uh, we had the, uh, the oil spill in the, in, in the Gulf. And President Obama established a presidential commission to investigate the deep water uh, horizon oil spill. Admiral Jim Ellis, who was our CEO from 2005 to 2012, and Dr. Zach Pate, who was our second uh, CEO and WANO chairman, uh, were asked to testify and to describe the U.S. nuclear industry's response to TMI and forming INPO. They discussed the five key attributes to impose continued success. The first one uh, 
These are the five. So the chief executive officer, nuclear safety focus, industry support, accountability, and independence. Now I'm going to talk about each of these. Go ahead, next slide. So the chief executive officer. So IMPO's authority comes from the board of direct. It's the board of directors. There's no legal, no moral, or patriarchal uh, authority. We only have CEO authority. We have about 12 to 15 CEOs at any one time uh, on our board, and they represent about 75% of the nuclear generating capacity in the U.S. So there is direct uh, CEO involvement in IMPO activities. As I said, they serve on the board. Uh, they, they embrace and participate fully in IMPO's programs and activities. They attend the exit meetings when one of their plants uh, has an IMPO evaluation. They uh, occasionally observe activities in the field. And they all participate on IMPO corporate evaluations. Uh, as I talked about the IMPO board of directors, when about every other board meeting, we talk about plant performance, or the CEOs talk about plant performance. And if one of the plants that is performing poorly, his CEO is at that, on that board, the others ask him what he's going to do to fix that plant's performance. They hold each other uh, accountable for improvement at their stations. We, we also have an annual IMPO CEO conference. Uh, we have, it's about a day and a half. Uh, Neil, you attend. Uh, we have all of the U.S. CEOs attend, and uh, we have all the, usually all the NRC commissioners attend and their staff, uh, and all the chief nuclear officers attend. And so there's an open session with uh, general presentations, but then there's an executive session uh, that is led by our C CEO, a Admiral Willard, and all the CEOs attend, and it is really a closed meeting. Uh, and in that meeting, all the assessments for all the plants in the country are shared. And so every CEO sees uh, where they rank, one to five, uh, in the country. We don't make this public, but we share it with the CEOs. And I tell you, when the CEOs walk out of there, if they're a poor, poor performing plant, uh, they'll go right to their CNO and ask him what he's going to do. So that would be Mr. Yagi saying to Mr. Toyamatsu, what are you going to do to fix that performance? Because I don't want to be there next year. Okay, next slide. So that, that was CEO involvement. So nuclear safety is, is, is key and singular to IMPO activities. We've been asked to get involved in a lot of things over the years, uh, but if it's not nuclear safety related, we don't do it. So for us, you know, safe, safety is a mindset and always need for improving. As I said earl earlier, regulatory compliance is necessary uh, but excellence requires more. Go ahead. Industry support is critical to IMPO. First of all, stations must be willing to ad adapt standards and host evaluations, reviews, and full participation. This means they need to send us the top-notch people, which they do. Uh, they, they need to uh, host an evaluation every two years, uh, and they need to take action on the things that are identified during it, their evaluations. So the industry works together to solve problems. There's little debate. they just rather get on with it and fix it. Uh, they provide resources, including site leaders on loan to us as advisors and peers. Next, please. One, th one thing I didn't mention on that slide was the CNO engagement, how they work together. Uh, some of you know that uh, uh, last September, Neil and I and all the U.S. CNOs uh, came together here and met with the Japanese CNOs. We, t we toured Fukushima, Daiichi, and Daini. And uh, we just shared uh, with, the, with our Japanese counterparts how we work together in the U.S. Uh, to, to improve performance. Accountability. So accountability is an interesting term. It, it, does, it doesn't uh, translate in some languages. 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a story just from last week on what accountability is to me. So last week we had a major snowstorm in Atlanta, two inches, two inches of snow. It shut down the city for three days. So, of course, immediately when it happened, all the politicians and city officials and state officials uh, were on the TV, and they, they blamed the meteorologist, right? So, but when you, what, what, of course, what the news people did is they ran back the tape and showed that the meteorologists were actually right. But what the, what the, what the city officials in the state did is, about 12 o'clock, they announced that all the government offices, all the schools, and all the private businesses should close and send their people home because this storm was coming. Well, what happened is, is everybody got on the road at the same time. I, I, my ride home is normally 20 minutes. It took me three hours. Bill Webster, who's one of our executive vice presidents, was here in Japan. Uh, he left on that day. He landed at 1.30. In, at, at Hartsfield Airport, it took him 14 hours to get home for an hour, one, normally a one hour drive. So I tell you that story because what has that got to do with accountability? Well, as I said, the people on the TV, the, the mayor was the best of Atlanta. He got on and he said, well, the highways are not my responsibility. That's the state's responsibility. The governor of the state was blaming the meteorologists. Nobody said, okay, listen, this, we made a mistake, and this is what we're going to do to fix it. That's accountability. They were responsible uh, for an emergency response, for deploying, but they didn't, when, when things went wrong, they didn't, they didn't say, okay, I, this, is, this is my fault, this is what I should have done to fix it. Not until five days later. So, but for IMPO, what that means is IMPO reports are confidential. We didn't start out uh, when we started our evaluations in the pilot phase making them confidential. Uh, but we quickly learned uh, that the plant's personnel would not be open and honest with us if we shared the reports openly with the regulator and the public. Uh, this, this is our practice. Uh, it's upheld many uh, litigations, lawsuits over the years, uh, and so, and, and that's the way we do it. Now, what we ask is for the stations to share the result with the resident inspector. We don't give them a report, because if we gave the, the NRC the report, it would have to go in the public domain, but they can read it, but they can't take copies with it. So the NRC is aware of the results, and we, as I said, we have frequent interactions with the NRC. They know who we're worried about, and we know who they're worried about. So we, we, we expect people to take action on the issues that we identify. As I said, there's a lot of peer pressure. And, and we asked, uh, you know, we're direct and honest with people. And we expect them not to rationalize by saying things like, oh, many plants have these same problems. Go ahead and change. So independence. Neil talked about EPRI's independence. Uh, it is very important that IMPO maintain its independence. Uh, even though we're dependent on the whole industry for support, uh, we are independent from any one member. Uh, we can hold members accountable for the greater good of the industry, and there's no special consideration uh, for any, any member. We are independent of the NRC and the DOE. As I said, we're complementary. Uh, we, we believe a foundation is a strong, capable M NR NRC, but they use different processes and have a different end state. We are independent of the public. We are not the nuclear advocate. That's the NEI's role. And we feel that would erode our, uh, erode our independence and credibility. We, we do not communicate to the public. Uh, that's a diff different sk skill set. And we don't, we don't share our reports with the Republic. As I said, we feel it would be diluted. Uh, the NRC is answerable to the public as, as uh, is the operating company. IMPO is only answerable to our board of directors. And independent is essential for our credibility. So to review, these are our early challenges. 
Uh, and there were, these were significant barriers to the formation and, and uh, operation of IMPO. Next slide, please. So these barriers and challenges were, were overcome in time by an effective application of the attributes of effective self-regulation. I was er asked earlier today about how does IMPO apply, uh, how does the self-regulation role, role apply to John C., especially in the uh, area with PRA. Now, IMPO has a totally different view of PRA than maybe EPRI does or others have, or the NRC. We believe that PRA is a useful tool to understand plan interactions and impact on safety. It's useful in comparing safety significance of systems or conditions in the plant, but PRA does not account for important intangibles such as safety culture and leadership, which significantly contribute to John C. Uh, you know, that's important for John C. to know. Uh, common end, end states are core damage and large early release. John C. must concern itself with less severe end states that can be masked by forces uh, focus on core damage or large early releases. In the U.S., NEI uh, coordinates industry PRA activities through working groups, task force, and the U.S. CNO's uh, participation with EPRI and the BWR and PWR owners group. PRA requires validated models and robust and accurate tools. This takes time and commitment, and John C. must resist saying what is safe enough. They must always strive for excellent, excellence. It's the job of the NRA and our NRC to determine what is safe enough, which PRA and safety goals can answer. For John C., it is a journey to excellence. And one final thought on this, comp and, uh, on this topic, it's a regular, regulatory tool and not inherently about excellence. So you can see we have a different approach. We're totally focused on excellence. So the result for us is a focus, lights came on, <laughs> on promoting nuclear safety within the industry. Go ahead, next slide. But the journey never stops, and excellence requires always reaching for the next new horizon. Here are a list of challenges that we at IMPO see today. Uh, weak corporate unit self-awareness and continuous improvement capability, shortfalls in addressing industry operating experience and adverse trends. I tell you, operating experience is, it's been an issue for many, many years that we haven't solved yet worker deficiencies in applying knowledge and skill, deficient suppliers, insufficient resilience against external events, and outliers that challenge nuclear safety and long-term uh, viability. In addition, we find that leadership capability must be able to adapt to ever-changing circumstances and performance. I'll just throw this up. Uh, this, this is part of our impose industry st strategic design. Uh, what we want to get to in the end uh, in 10 years is excellent plant perform uh, performance, uh, organizations that are resilient with no outliers and strong suppliers and support. The things that IMPO does to influence that is to set standards, measure and compare to those standards, facilitate performance improvement, and be the self-regulation authority. Next slide, please. So what IMPO has done and con uh, continues to do and work at every day is something that the Japan Nuclear Safety Institute can do, but it is hard and the road is rough. It's not easy. Uh, please keep in mind that the comments that are made concerning the challenge challenges with uh, Johnson are essentially the same as in the U.S. after Three Mile Island. Now, over the years, we... we uh, you know, we've had some good results in the U.S., but we also had some events that have challenged the way we do business. Davis Bessey, uh, reactor vessel head degradation in 2002 uh, was a big surprise to IMPO in the NRC. It really was. Even though we had early enough indications of the management issues at that station, 
as, and, and a, as a result of that, we, we dramatically change the way we do impo evaluations after that. So we're all, always adapting, looking for ways to change. We just rewrote our performance objectives and criteria. And we, for the first time ever, we've worked together with Wano. So we all have the same set of performance objectives and criteria. Okay. So today, IMPO is, the, is in the fabric of the US industry. The, the industry allows uh, us to be the driving force for nuclear excellence. Our mission is clear, focused, and unchanging as the demands on the industry continue to increase. And keep in mind who John C. is responsible to. That is the men and women who operate the nuclear stations. Nuclear safety is our first value adopted, and it will never be abandoned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, listening to the presentation, um, what impressed me most is this term excellence. I was thinking, what would be the equivalent word in Japanese? Now, we would like to um, solicit questions or questions. We don't have much time, but we still would like to entertain some. Yes, please. I am from Chubu Electric Power Company. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, after the TMI accident, the utilities on a voluntary basis um, conducted self-regulation to build or rebuild trust. And that was really encouraging for us as well. So thank you very much. Now, I have a question about information disclosure. In your presentation, you talked about plant evaluations and other information that are kept confidential. You don't publish um, the results. On the other hand, in promoting nuclear business, um, of course, uh, transparency and disclosure of information is uh, expected or um, encouraged in society. So I was wondering what sort of discussion con was conducted in the United States and the confidentiality of the information. Um, is it something that is already accepted or is it something still causing some hot debate? What's the current situation, please? You know, we, we, we have no debate in the U.S. over this issue anymore. Uh, as I said, uh, this has passed uh, many litigation efforts, uh, uh, and uh, we've taken it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, they've up, upheld our independence. Uh, part, part of the reason is, is we do have a strong regulator. Uh, they, they get all of the events from the station uh, reported to the regulator. Uh, the regulator has a very robust... Uh, understanding of the, the nuclear power industry in the U.S. Uh, and uh, the INPO methodology has shown to improve station performance uh, and, not, and, and, and the fact that we haven't uh, shared it with the public has, has not hurt in any way. Thank you. Yes, please, Mr. Sachi. I have a question about peer review. In the presentation earlier, you talked about safety performance and you used the rating between one through five. Now, for a high rating, uh, you strive and what about incentives for the utilities? I think uh, incentives will be very um, effective, such as economic incentives. Uh, it would really drive them to work really harder for a better rating. So in reality, how, it, how does that work? Is there any incentives or anything in the United States? Yes, there is. Uh, so uh, plants that are assessed a one uh, get a discount on their insurance uh, premium uh, from Neil. That, that's one, one lever we have. But the other, the real, uh, the negative side, if you wish, is the peer pressure. Uh, uh, the, the CEOs really believe in, uh, in helping and supporting each other. Uh, and th they really pressure each other to improve. 
And as I said, our, our Impo board, one of the first things they told our new CEO when he took over in May 2012, you need to help eliminate the outliers. So that's a big part of our strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Matsura. Thank you. Matsura from Jansi. So we're going to work based on uh, impose activities using that as a model. And uh, you taught us comprehensively uh, what we need to keep in mind as we move forward. I think uh, you're uh, sort of encouraging and also uh, 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 telling us uh, to do a good job. Now, you say independent of public opinion and uh, free from public opinion is what this may mean. Now, in Japan, if we clearly state this, uh, that would create a very difficult uh, situation for us, for our party. But is this acceptable in the U.S.? This will not be criticized to, to state that you are independent of public opinion? As I said, uh, we, we, we have had no, I mean, in the early days, it was difficult. It really was, especially when we didn't have credibility. Uh, but as soon as we could show, start showing that we were helping to improve plant safety and reliability, uh, the challenges went away. Uh, and and, and uh, we, we've had a number of uh, uh, key things that happened uh, in, in the history of IMPO. Uh, one of the earlier ones, um, and, I, and I didn't talk about this uh, because of time, but I'll talk about it now, is, is that... Uh, in the early days, uh, the NRC, as I told you, they, they, they were struggling. They were under a lot of pressure, and they wanted to create a lot of new rules and regulations. Uh, one of the things they wanted to make was a training rule. And INPO in the industry uh, fought back. And uh, what, what we didn't want is the NRC was just going to say, OK, to be a shift supervisor, this is the training you have to have. And there was, would be no discussion from the industry. Uh, so IMPO really established a working group, and they did, we did a job and task analysis for every critical job in the plant, you know, from chemist to operator to maintenance uh, worker. Uh, now, the, the NRC wanted to extend that to even janitors in the plant, and we said that's ridiculous, you know, that doesn't touch uh, nuclear safety. So our, uh, our CEO at the time, the first thing he did is, uh, and it's almost 33 years ago, uh, what we call as the famous Groundhog Day speech. So Groundhog Day in the U.S., I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in, in Pennsylvania, we have a groundhog that they make come out of his little house on February 2nd, and if he sees or doesn't see a shadow, uh, that forecasts the future weather. Well, our CEO at the time, he told the U.S. CEOs that they were like that groundhog. They were putting their heads in the ground and waiting six months to pop back up to see if uh, things had improved. And he, and he really told them uh, that it is their job to get involved, to get engaged, and just not let the NRC dictate their future. So they really supported uh, uh, the establishment of this training uh, task force to develop the training needs. And uh, a, a big, big um, credibility thing for IMPO out of that was uh, the special committee to the President of the United States uh, and the NRC supported uh, the way the, the industry uh, was resolving the training issue. And the, and the NRC did not issue a training rule. So that was a big uh, success for IMPO. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I now um, understand IMPO better. Just one question. Uh, within the core work or activities you explained uh, and you mentioned evaluation, so that is peer review. That's my understanding. 
and the one who conducts peer reviews as well. So evaluation in this is peer reviews and how peer reviews are to be conducted. And that's how I interpreted that evaluation. Now, one question is the result of peer reviews, how they are to be leveraged. Now, what you have done in that front in the United States versus Jap uh, the sites um, and the plants in Japan, there are organizational differences and how to use PRA uh, or rather peer review results. Um, maybe there can be some different approaches to the utilization of uh, peer review results. That's how Japanese have um, thought about the use of peer reviews and their results. But if we in Japan are to better utilize peer reviews and their results, how do you think we should use the results of peer reviews. Uh, if you have any thoughts on that, I would appreciate it. It, it really sounds like there's two parts of the question. One is, is that, let me uh, say that WANO, like IMPO, uh, believes that their reports should be confidential and not released to the public. That's one thing. So that, that, that's the WANO position. Uh, after the Fukushima accident, uh, the initial uh, Fukushima, post-Fukushima commission uh, said that WANO needed to be more transparent and open to the public. Uh, but what they've decided now is that for the reports, they're going to maintain that confidentiality. They're going to try to be transparent in other areas, but the peer review reports, uh, they're really for the CEO of the company and his staff uh, to use to improve their performance. Uh, now, it's, it's incumbent on WANO, I'll talk WANO, it's incumbent on WANO to ensure if they give a, that one, they give a quality peer review, right? And it, or John C. In, uh, in, in, for Japanese plants, that the, the peer reviews that are conducted are quality, you have top people doing those. Uh, and, and then the, the plants will accept the results and they will take action. Uh, and it's up to Wano and John C. to hold the plants accountable for those actions. And, that, and that's how you drive improvement. And, and it really doesn't matter whether they're released to the public or not. Thank you. Mr. Kimoto? So two questions back about the uh, training requirement. So uh, was mentioned that uh, uh, you had some discussion with the NRC about the training requirements. So maybe my understanding uh, is not correct, but uh, well, you, you say that uh, uh, abiding by regulation uh, is, of course, a, a mandate, and uh, striving for excellence is imposed role. So then, if there is uh, unnecessary regulation, uh, isn't it the role of NEI to negotiate with the regulator if there is unnecessary regulation? Uh, but uh, you do this evaluation? Well, the, the evaluation part should be done by IMPO and the negotiation by NEI. And NEI was established uh, later, so was it because NEI was not established at that time? Uh, yeah, any, uh, when we had the training issues in the early 80s, uh, NEI wasn't there uh, to be the industry-facing. Uh, yeah, today, today if uh, we have an issue like containment venting, it is really uh, NEI that goes before the NRC, that goes before Congress the, and the public and to talk about those issues. It's not IMPO. Now, IMPO uh, will weigh in, you know, give our, uh, you know, our opinion, but it's really NEI that is the industry facing or the NRC facing uh, uh, or the public facing uh, uh, industry representative. Thank you. I think in Japan, Jansi and CREAP and FEPC are all working on this. And Jansi, uh, unlike IMPO, uh, I think has strict uh, uh, guidelines uh, about openness. Well, maybe some changes uh, for Jansi, uh, but uh, everything was open with Janti. 
but uh, in Japan, I think we need something that uh, reflects NEI. So, who does the uh, control? Who does the steering? I think that's a critical issue for Japan. So, I think we have to learn from the US and uh, establish that kind of an entity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had a full round. And thank you very much for a very uh, meaningful and useful presentation. And finally, uh, since we have this rare opportunity of having two guests from the United States making presentations and now, finally, do you have any comments or uh, any advice to the nuclear industry in Japan? Your advice or input will be very much appreciated. So maybe I can I ask uh, Mr. Wilms first, first, and then Mr. Spinato. Short phrase, maybe phrases. Okay. Um, probably just to reiterate something I touched on before. It's don't underestimate the power of collaborating and sharing. No one utility has all the best practices, all the good ideas. An industry gets better by openly sharing what each of you is good at. So, uh, Thank you. Mr. Spinato? As, uh, as our international participant, uh, uh, John C. Uh, represents the uh, Japanese utilities, and all work we do pretty much in uh, Japan is either through John C. or through Wano Tokyo Center. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, we have an agreement with John C. Uh, we have very, uh, for the first time, uh, we, we, we have actually, in this agreement we've written, uh, we, we've put expectations in that agreement uh, for a CEO uh, utility engagement in John C. Uh, and uh, to be honest, if uh, our CEO has said if uh, the utility CEOs uh, and companies are not engaged in John C., uh, we will back away. Uh, we, we, we will provide support as long as the Japanese utilities really want support and support John C. So I encourage uh, a strong support for John C. And uh, like I said, the, uh, the road is long and tough. But John C. can be successful. My, my 10 year goal is that John C. and Impor are equivalent, and we're sharing best practices. Thank you very much for a very encouraging statement. And uh, with that, we like to uh, close since it's already past our scheduled ending time. And as for the future, this uh, working group. Uh, has to uh, summarize uh, uh, its uh, discussions toward the end of the fiscal year. So uh, next uh, meeting onwards, uh, we're going to review uh, the past uh, discussions. And uh, uh, well, we already have uh, created an uh, interim summary, and we're going to uh, uh, make that even more detailed and uh, 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 come up with some conclusions. And the Secretariat will provide some materials and we have three more meetings planned. Next one is 25th of February, then March 14th, then March 25th. And that will uh, be the end uh, for this working group. So I ask for your continued active participation. So I thank you all uh, for joining us in this very long session. And with that, I'd like to close the ninth working group on voluntary efforts on continuous improvement of nuclear safety. Thank you very much.